G'day folks, Uncle Nackers here. Now look, as many of you already know, I like to dabble in all things DIY, along with other woodworking related type activities. Mainly just little projects here and there, and occasionally, just occasionally, I'll throw in a monster of a dabble, which in this case, was this. An entire home renovation project from demolition to completion as an owner builder. Now I have to say that the whole process, well, it almost killed me. The workload, it was off the charts. The job took around 10 months and I had to work virtually seven days a week. And then to top it all off, I then had to video and edit all the footage. I must have been totally mad to even contemplate it, but I did and it's done. Thank God. So come with me all the way back to 2015 when I was a much younger, skinnier man with longer hair and I'll walk you through just what it takes to take a house from this to this. Now, as you'd expect, on a project like this, you're going to have plenty of highs and plenty of lows. So, grab yourself some popcorn and a beverage as I guide you through a warts and all, tell all of exactly what it takes to undergo a massive project just like this as a time poor owner builder on a very limited budget. And I do mean limited. Now the second bit of exciting news, you see that old place there? That's our old beach shack, which we bought a couple of years ago with the intention of doing the old girl up. Well, two years have passed and our plans have just been approved by council. So for the bit of luck, a renovation is on the cards. So we've decided to go own a builder on this project with the intention of trying to save a few dollars. Now, what do they say about owner builders? It's good, they're good for three things. Um, relationship breakdowns, budget blowouts, and increased stress levels. Sounds promising. Anyway, since Christmas, I've been busy getting quotes together so that we can approach the bank to hopefully get a loan, fingers crossed. And if that goes through, the majority of this year will be spent on that project right there. Now, the exciting thing is, is that if it all goes ahead, what I want to do is to do a DIY owner builder series where I take everything from start to finish so you can track my progress and see what I'm doing. Even check out my mistakes. Hopefully not too many. And with a bit of luck, you'll learn something along the way. For instance, this old house is just tack-on after tack-on, and each of those tack-ons is clad with asbestos. So I'll go through the whole process of how to remove it and then dispose of it. So I think we'll all learn something along the way. So potentially, this could be a massive year, and I'll even throw in a few pellet projects just to mix things up a little bit. So I hope you can all come along for the ride. Until then, I'm out of here. Cheers. G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here. Excuse me. Yep. Sorry. What's happened? Okay. Looks like we need to cross to the newsroom for some breaking news. Good afternoon. Breaking news just in. The Conlon family have finally had their loan approved for their beach shack renovation. Well done to the Conlons. And now over to sport. Yep, it finally came through. And I have to say that I'm pretty excited, but I'm also a little bit nervous at the same time. Now, before we kick off with all the nitty gritty of actually building a house, I just thought I'd take you on a quick little tour of my little town, just so you can get a feel for the place and see why we love it and why we've decided to set up shop here. So strap yourself in 
and let's go for a drive. Now one of the really great things about living where we live is that we're only about a 30 second drive from the beach, which is about a five minute walk. It's fantastic. So that's the surf club right in front of us. So I might just duck in here, get a park, and I'll give you a quick squeeze at it. So here we are, just walking up to the surf club, and we'll get a good view of the beach from there. We've got our little kiosk here, good place for some bacon and eggs in the morning, or a hamburger at lunch. Beautiful day today, middle of winter, and it's Tuesday morning. Any people out there? So this is the beach. It's midweek. Bit of wind. Sorry about that. All the way down here. Now I think next we'll go down. That surf by saving tower, go up to that headland and take a look up there. But it's a beautiful place to be, no doubt about that. Okay, so we'll just now head up to the headland, also known as Southies, or the surface. It's just a nice protected part of the beach uh, where there's often lots of waves but um, not sure about today we'll see how we go and this is the estuary that feeds into the ocean on the way up to the headland it's a great place to go for a fish and you can also throw in a boogie board or some flotation device and the tide will take you all the way up the creek and out the back. It's awesome. Great spot. So here we are on our way up to the headland. We'll just check it out. See how the conditions are today. It's always a bit tricky sometimes trying to find a park up here, but it doesn't look too bad today. See if I can duck in somewhere and get a spot. There we go. Plenty of room. Sneak in here. Get out for a look. So here's the headland, and over there we've got the mountains. Pretty good. And we've got a few surfers there today. Few kids away in school, no doubt. Maybe my kids will be amongst them. Who knows? And then all the way out here. Not a bad little spot. Could be worse. show you the main street, which is just tucked in behind the beach, and it 
is quite famous for its beautiful Morton Bay figs. There's huge trees here that line the street. Now, this is a beautiful place to be in summer as it's just so shady. Now, this street here is also shop a block full of coffee shops. Wouldn't surprise me if my wife's in one right now. Haven't seen her all day. Anyway, we'll just do a yui down the end here. Give way to that bus. Might be handy. And duck on down the other side of the street. Now, because this is such a small town, we do know quite a few people here. So coming down here to do your business can often take a lot longer than it normally would. Which I think is one of the best things about living in a small town. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed my little tour of my little town. I think it's now time to get back to the job site. Right on. So what would you think? I hope you enjoyed your own personal tour of my little hometown. But now I think it's time to get a bit more serious and get stuck into building an actual house. And the first thing that we need to do is to move out. And as luck would have it, the day that we got our loan approved, a house came up for rent 100 metres from where we live now. So we applied for that and we got it. So, guess what we're doing over Easter? Happy days. So we're getting closer and closer to an actual start date and in the next episode I'd like to walk you through the house as it stands now and talk to Tony Ross from architectural firm Design Studio 22. These are the guys that designed our new pad so I hope you can stick around for that one. G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here and welcome to episode 3 of my Owner Builder series. Now today I just want to take you for a quick walk through the old house as it stands now just so you can see what's there and what we have to deal with and then have a quick chat about our renovation plans with Tony Ross from Design Studio 22. So grab your skates and let's go for a tour. So there's the front door that I just walked through and that leads into basically one room. So we've got our lounge room and if we swing around, here's our beautiful designer kitchen. What a shame to demolish that. And then there's our kitchen hutch. Uh, that's our pantry, those two doors. And then there's two bedrooms. There's the young fella's bedroom and there's our bedroom there. So as you can see, it's a fairly cosy living arrangement. Now, if we go through this door here, we come into the fridge room. Yes, its own designated room. So the fridge used to go there. There's the office in there. If we swing around, there's the bathroom just there with my footprints in red paint. Now, check this out. I think this is the world's tallest and most impractical spa bath. Very snazzy. Don't ask me why, I didn't build it. It was here when we bought the place. So from the fridge room, we go through this door and enter the garage. Now you might recognize this place as where I used to do most of my YouTube videos. There's my old workbench, and I have a couch for sale. It's going cheap. I know you want it. So from the garage, we keep walking outside and down this footpath to the old bungalow where my two teenage boys sleep. Now it's been a fantastic room because it's given the boys a bit of privacy, which has been really good. Now, it's very interesting because when we first bought this place, we noticed how there were a truckload of power points in this room, which we thought was a bit odd. So I think there may have been some horticultural activities going on in here in a previous life. And check this out. It's our old CRT TV. 
I think we're the only people in Australia who still have one. Anyway, out of the boys' room and into the back storeroom, which is where the kids had their own toilet, which was really good. And this room here was just a storage room for all of my junk, which I hope to get rid of very shortly. Just so you can get a clearer picture of the existing dwelling, there's the front door that I walked into. There's the existing designer kitchen. There's our lounge room, our bedroom, the young fella's bedroom, the bathroom with my footprints in it, the fancy fridge room, the office, the garage, the boys' bungalow, the outdoor storeroom with the kids' toilet. And all that's remaining is this section here. Everything else, all the add-ons, the lean-tos and the garage, they are all being demolished. So there's the old beach shack in a nutshell. And these add-ons and lean-tos, they'll be all demolished during the renovation phase. And as you'd expect, they are chock-a-block full of asbestos. Asbestos, it's just another one of those hidden costs that you have to factor in before you even start. Guess what time it is? Demolition time! <laughs> Now, a word of caution. Before you start pulling up floors and smashing down walls and taking off roofs, it's very important, especially in an older house like this one, which is over 70 years old, which is nearly as old as my old TV. Woohoo! What a beast. I'm not getting rid of it. I'm not. Should I? That you determine whether or not any of those materials contain asbestos. For instance, I know for a fact that this sheeting here contains asbestos because I know that this addition was built back in the 1970s and as a result, this will need to be removed by a licensed asbestos contractor. However, follow me. Now just around the corner from that last sheet that I showed you is this addition here which was built back in the 1990s and I wasn't quite sure whether this cladding contained asbestos. So to find out whether the sheet did or didn't contain asbestos I had a sample tested by an asbestos testing company. Try saying that fast three times and this is the sticker that they place on the sheet where the sample was taken from. And just for the record, this hole here is from a football and not from the asbestos testing company. Kids, seriously. Now, as well as having the exterior and interior cladding tested for asbestos, I also tested some of these floor coverings. These vinyl tiles often have asbestos within them, either in the backing board or in the tile glue. And the same can be said for other types of floor coverings, just like this lino here, which I've also had tested. So the tests have come back and the news is really good. So you can see from the report that the asbestos detected was no for all four samples. So that's great news. So why is that good news? Well, it's just saved me a bucket load of cash because I can now remove that material myself. Now, if a licensed contractor was to do it, let's do the sums. I had 40 square meters of suspect asbestos material. Now, a licensed contractor will charge you between 50 and $100 per square meter to remove and dispose of that material. Now, going on the lower end of the scale of $50 per square meter, multiply that by my 40 and we come to a total cost of two thousand dollars. Now deduct my costs. The report was 200 and each sample was 50. So that's 200 plus 200 is 400 plus a GST of 10% total 440. Deduct that from two grand and we've made a saving of $1,560. Now that is not too bad. You know what? I think this asbestos thing requires at least one more video because I know a lot of you are out there saying, can I do this myself? Well, legally here in Australia, you can remove 
10 square meters. So in my next video, I'm going to bring in Peter Green from Green Brothers Asbestos Removals. Peter's an expert and he'll go through the equipment, the legalities and the process you have to go through. So I hope you can all stick around for that one. Well, I can't believe it. We're finally at the demolition phase. So I thought now would be the perfect time to shoot some footage of the old girl before I start tearing parts of it down. So here's the front of the house and there's the garage to the side. And you can see we've just put up the construction fence. And this is the view from the back of the house. And you can see that I have already started pulling down the old tin shed that used to house all of my pallet wood. So I'm doing all the demolition by myself, which is going to be a little tough because number one, I'm just not that work fit. Oh, I'm almost 50, so I think the old body is going to feel it. And number two is that I have a real time constraint. I take my young fella to school at nine o'clock and I pick him up at 10 to three. So I have a real narrow window to get a lot of work done. This is going to be nuts. So when demolishing your project, don't just throw everything into the skip bin. That will just make it way heavier and heavier, which will cost you more to dispose of. Stuff like this roofing iron, this weighs a ton. You can get rid of this by taking it to a metal merchant. They'll dispose of it and they might even give you a few dollars for your efforts. And the same thing goes for things like light fittings, bathroom fixtures, or even the timber from your roof or your wall framing. Try and sell it all because every bit counts. I wonder how much that'd take for the wife. Hmm. <laughs> what a shame to be getting rid of such a beautiful toilet. Mustard yellow, nice. Seriously, I don't know why I'm renovating. There's nothing wrong with the old joint. Ah. With most of the external plating all taken down, it's now time for the internal linings. I have to say, I've been looking forward to this one. And don't worry, that's not connected. Here we go. Oh yeah. So there you have it, day one complete. And I didn't do too bad, not too bad at all. But the old back, it's a bit dodgy. But hopefully it'll pull up okay tonight, all ready to do it all again tomorrow. Well, the demolition is going really well and we're almost finished. The only thing left is to remove this old floor from the old bungalow. And I just thought I'd show you a really homemade technique of easily removing these boards. So you'll need two things for this job. And the first is a set of old Stilsons with a length of pipe to fit over the handle. And that'll act as a lever to pry up the boards. And the second thing you'll need is a jemmy bar, also known as a wrecking bar. So this is how it works. Just get place the Stilsons next to the joist 
we give it a bit of a lift like that get your jemmy bar under it lift up too easy go to your next board same deal give it a lift put your jemmy bar under give it a lift done off to the next board give it a tap lift jemmy bar under it And there you have it. So there you have it. How simple is that? And it all has to do with the length of the lever. And when you think about it, the Egyptians built the pyramids using levers and a couple of old sleds. So there has to be something in it there. And the added bonus of this system is that it's fantastic for the old back because I'm not leaning over so far. Great tip, knackers. Well, it's six days down the track and the demolition is basically all done. So I'm pretty happy about that. It's been a bit of a slog. It's rained virtually every day, but we knuckled down and we did it. And by we, I mean I. <sighs> Glad to see the end of that. Now, the great thing about doing my own demolition was that I saved a bucket load of cash. I had quotes ranging from $10,000 to $15,000 to get that demolished and all the material disposed of. I did it by myself and it cost me zip. My next door neighbor, Max, whose best mate is Roy, who is an absolute champion and over 80 years of age, took all the iron off the roof free of charge. And then to get rid of all my timber, I had a bucket load of the stuff. I put an ad on Gumtree and that went like that. So the bottom line is, is that I got rid of all the material free of charge, which is absolutely fantastic. With most of the demolition now complete, it's time to prepare the site in preparation for the slab. Now this is a bit of a bittersweet moment because I want the slab laid, but to do that, you have to cut down some of these big old trees, which is a real shame because not only do they provide a home for a lot of bird life, which you can hear in most of my videos, but they also cast beautiful shade over our backyard in the heat of summer. Oh well. Sorry birdies, have to find a new home. Look out, down she comes, Timber! Wow, what a difference one day can make. I can't believe how big the yard looks now that those trees are gone. But we did keep one, and that was that old paper bark right there. And we'll shine some lights up through that when we do our landscaping. But I think we'll need to grow some quick growing trees along our fence lines just to give us some privacy. And while I'm at it, I'd like to give a shout out to Mark and Chris who are the guys who cut down our trees and ground the stumps. These guys did a fantastic job. So what's next on the agenda? I've got the slab penciled in for 12 days time. So in that time frame, we need to remove all of those existing slabs. And then once that's done, clear the site and then get a surveyor in to peg out the project. And while all that's going on, it's a great idea to get back in contact with your plumber the electrician and your termite guy just to make sure that they're going to be available for when the slab's about to be poured and also get back in contact with your window manufacturer and your frame and truss manufacturer because sometimes those processes can take up to four to five weeks or even longer so if you don't get in now you may find your time frames just blown out the window and you don't want that to happen g'day knuckleheads uncle knackers here big day today and it's freezing it's 6.30 in the morning and in the middle of winter. This is nuts. Well, maybe I'm just getting soft. Either or. I've got a bobcat here today 
isn't she a beauty, to help with the removal of these old existing concrete slabs. And to give the overall site a bit of a tidy up, because at the moment it's looking a little bit trashed. These machines are pretty noisy, and it's only 6.30 in the morning, so I don't think the neighbours are going to be too thrilled. And I don't think their chooks are going to be laying any eggs for the next couple of days either. Absolutely amazing, but this old air conditioner actually still works. Incredible. Sorry old girl, but it's time to go to the tip. Oh, it's heavy too. With the site now clean, it just looks and feels so much better. Now, let's have a crack at removing those old slabs. How's this for bad timing? We've just filled the back of the truck up, chock-a-block full of concrete. We looked down and noticed that we have a flat tire. Absolutely spewing. You wouldn't read about it. Oh well, whinging won't fix it. Let's do it. La -da -da, da -da -da. And as you can see now, things are starting to take shape. And there's that pile of concrete. Looks like we've been through an earthquake. I'm always amazed at how powerful a bobcat and a mini excavator are. These are big slabs of concrete, and these are big old footings. And they do it with ease. It's pretty incredible. And to think I was considering using a sledgehammer, a demo saw, and a crowbar. What was I thinking? Obviously I wasn't. Here comes Frank, I better move. And here it is, all done. Not a skerrick of concrete is left and it all went really well, except for one spot that was a little bit unexpected. There's always one thing, always. Trust me. We discovered that the driveway had three slabs poured on top of one another. Who does that? Three slabs. Someone who likes laying slabs, I suppose. Slab person. So there you have it. The slabs are now gone and the site is now clear, so we can tick that job off and an added bonus was that we didn't need to call that number there which is always a possibility whenever you're demolishing things alrighty episode 9 or 10 I can't remember coming up is going to be about pouring the slab so I hope you can stick around for that one well after a lot of hard work we're finally at that point of being ready to have the slab prepped and then poured even though the slab is now ready to be prepped and poured, I have to tell you that the last couple of days have been the most stressful times I've had in a long, long time. So these are the turn of events 
which caused my blood pressure to go through the roof. On Friday, I had a surveyor come out to peg out the project. On Saturday, I had a good friend of mine, Steve Spagnolo, coming out to give me a hand to set up the profiles. It poured rain on Saturday, so Steve O couldn't come. Sunday, day with the kids. Monday was a public holiday, but Steve, being the good bloke that he is, came out and gave me a hand. We set the profiles up and noticed that things weren't quite right, and then discovered that the survey was running out by 100 millimetres. There's the surveyor's peg there with the nail, and there's the actual building line. Mmm, not happy, Jan. So what do we do? The slab is getting prepped and poured on Thursday. We only have Tuesday and Wednesday to get it re-surveyed, re-profiled, and the plans redrawn. I am freaking out. Now this is where having a great design team behind you really pays off. Tony from Design Studio 22, you may have met him back in episode four or five, and Ian Everson, my surveyor, they came out on the Tuesday and got the whole thing sorted out for me. And the whole thing happened because the old house wasn't built where it said it was supposed to be built, which is pretty typical of an older style home. So I guess the lesson for new players is to check and recheck everything, especially when renovating an old house like this one here, because nothing's ever square, and in my case, the house wasn't even in the right position. Lesson learnt. Now, before I go on, I just want to rethank Tony Ross from Design Studio 22 and Ian Everson Surveyors. You guys did a power of work and got me out of a potentially disastrous situation. Much appreciated. All right, with all that done and the stress levels down, let's have a crack at pouring that slab. How typical is this? I've organized the concreters to come in today. And look at that, it's been raining all night. It's an absolute sludge pile out there. Seriously, trying to organize concrete is like trying to predict a sunny day for an outdoor wedding or an outdoor birthday party. It's just not going to happen. You can nearly always guarantee that it's going to rain. And it's not going to get much better. Check out the next six days. Rain every single day. You wouldn't read about it. Oh, what a schmozzle. So you're having an outdoor wedding. All right, we'll be needing a raincoat, uh, gumboots, umbrella. Um, sorry, you're pouring concrete when? Okay, you'll be needing gumboots, a raincoat, uh, umbrella. Uh, I think you get the drift. Well, I've just spoken to the concreters and they've declared it too wet. <laughs> I didn't expect that. <coughs> With the job now delayed, I think I'll make this into a two-part episode. So I guess the main thing that we learnt from this episode, especially for the owner-builder, is how important it is to have a really good design team behind you, especially when dealing with an old house. You just never know what's going to present itself. So I hope you can stick around for part two of episode 10. That's where we'll be boxing up for the slab and then pouring the concrete. Should be a beauty. Alrighty, as per usual, big thumbs up is always greatly appreciated. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to check out my Facebook page at DIY for Knuckleheads. Alrighty, I've got an early mark today, so I might even lash out, go down the street, and get myself a cuppa. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. I just thought I'd quickly pop on by and share with you a very handy little tip. Check it out. If you intend to be an owner builder and you're doing a job similar to this one, then you're going to have to learn the simple art of tying a tight string line. It can't be that hard, surely. Just wrap it around like that and then I'll tie it off by doing a double granny, double sheep shank, truckies knot. Hang on, just that's it, look at that. Too easy. Yeah, that's 
seriously. Get loose. Tighten that up. Let's see something a bit easier than that. I've got it. Right here. That's it like that. Uh, how do I tighten that? Uh, right. Uh -huh. uh, hmm. There must be a simpler way. Now the reason for the video is that if you're ever doing something like a slab layout, putting up roof trusses, or even laying floorboards, you'll be working off string lines. And the tighter you can get them, the better it is. Some guys like the method of simply making a loop with your finger and twirling the line around it half a dozen times. Get that loop there and place it over the nail. You can then pull that as tight as you want. And as soon as you get the tightness you require, just pull it back up against that nail. Give the string a couple of winds. And there you have it. And to loosen it, just reverse the process. And you finish up, bang, all done. Now personally, I'm not a big fan because after a period of time, you finish up with a very twisty string line. Now the method that I prefer is to get your string and just wrap it around the nail once. Now you can pull that as tight as you like. And when you get it to where you want, which is like that there, just wrap the string around the nail four or five times, then bring it down under that string, over the top, and bang, you are done. And to release it, all you have to do is reverse the process. How simple was that? So there you go. So there you go. That's how you tie a string line. Great tip, knackers! G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here, and welcome to episode 10, part three of my Owner Builder series. Big day, and I've got a little bit of a surprise for you. But first of all, you'll need to be blindfolded. Oh yeah! Now we're talking. Okay, let's cover your eyes up like that. Hey, stop looking. Now, follow me and watch your step. It's a bit tricky. Okay, that's it. Come on. So I'll just take the blindfold off and check it out. The slab's been poured and it looks fantastic. I'm absolutely wrapped. Well done, fellas. Love it. And this is how it all went together. So once all the crusher dust has been laid, it's time to put down some plastic. Now the purpose of the plastic is to act as a waterproof membrane, which is pretty handy if you intend to lay something like a timber floor over the top of the slab. And here the boys are busily taping up all the joins. And while they're doing all that, the other guys are back at the truck unloading all the steel, which is the next process. And check this out for a well-oiled machine. Good stuff. Keep it up, boys. I like it. So here the lads are installing all that steel work. And first of all, they'll put in all the trench mesh followed by the regular mesh over the top of that. Now you need to keep the mesh up and off the ground and they do that by using these black plastic chairs. Lots and lots of black plastic chairs. This is back breaking work. Well that was a big day but also a good day because the boys knuckled down and got all the plastic and steel work done. Good stuff. Now all that's left is for the inspector to come along and inspect all that steel work. After he's been, the electrician will come along and put in his conduit for the kitchen island bench, which will then be followed by the termite guy. And then, day after that, bang, 
concrete pour. Happy days. Now just in regard to pre-slab termite protection, don't forget to slide these termite barriers over all your pipe penetrations. These barriers prevent the termites from coming up through and under your slab and up along your pipe work. And for those who are wondering, this here is just an earth wire. We don't want anybody getting zapped, now do we? Or do we? So the concrete pour is about to start and this is just the calm before the storm. And we've kicked off and just check out how much money is spewing out of the end of that concrete pump. Now that is scary. And just in case you're wondering what that long dangly thing is in Waz's hands, the guy with the yellow shirt, that's a vibrator. Hmm, a vibrator. And they use that to ensure that the concrete gets right amongst all the steel and down in the trenches. Now that beeping sound you could just hear is coming from a receiver which is attached to Damo's level. Now that receiver is picking up a beam which has been shot out from this laser and you can see the red light flashing around. Now that beam gives the height for the screeders to work their concrete to. Now to get the concrete from the street to the actual job, we need a concrete pump truck, which is that red one there. And we also need a normal concrete truck. Now the concrete truck feeds concrete into the hopper of the red concrete pump truck. Now try saying that fast three times, I dare ya. And from the hopper of the red concrete pump truck, the concrete goes along these pipes, it's a series of pipes, up our driveway and out the end of the pipe where the boys are working. It's a pretty cool bit of kit. We're getting close to the end now and it's starting to look really good. But I have to say that when the concrete's being poured, it's all hands on deck. It's crazy. And with the pour done, the concrete pump boys are heading home. See you fellas. And now it's time for a well-earned break before the boys head back and finish off the slab. Hmm, I wonder what's for lunch? The boys are now just putting the finishing touches to the slab with a steel float on the end of a long extension pole. Look at that, it's coming up a treat. Beautiful. So what we have here is Farmy using the helicopter, which just puts a nice finishing touch on the top of the slab. And you can see the boys here doing a broom finish to our deck area. And the reason for that is that the deck's going to be covered in decking boards, so a super fine finish isn't really necessary. It's getting late in the day now and the boys are almost done. I think it's nearly a beer o'clock. Let's knock off fellas. And that's it. Well, the slab's down, so 
So it's time to do some framing. But before I do that, I want to restump and re-level this old existing part of the house because currently it's a bit out of whack. So we'll work on that first and once that's done, then we'll have a crack at doing some wall framing. So whenever you re-level or re-stump a house, you need to find a point where all your heights are taken from and that's called the datum point. And in my instance, my datum point is right here. And I determined that because the new hallway comes through here and through to the new house. The new slab is just, just there. And the height of that slab was determined from that datum point. So when I re-level this house, that datum point there is where all the heights will be taken from. So to make life a little simpler, I'm going to be removing these wall linings. Bang, 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 and bang. Now these were going to be removed anyway, but by doing it now, that will give my laser a nice clean, clear line of sight. So that should make re-leveling the floor a little easier. Now these wall linings are the old horsehair plaster type. So they're as heavy as lead. And as a result, I just can't pull them down in one big sheet because I'm doing it by myself and it's just too heavy and too awkward. So what I intend to do is to get my grinder and cut a horizontal line along the entire length of that wall. That way I can remove each piece bit by bit. And just be aware that when using a grinder, to do this sort of job that you've checked for any power or water pipes that may be running through those walls. All of mine have been terminated, so all's good. And also just be aware that this is going to create a truckload of dust and it's going to be noisy. So make sure you've got your hearing protection and your dust mask on. Alrighty, let's do it. it was gonna be dusty. <laughs> so this is what I'm talking about when I refer to a horsehair wall lining. It's just a whole heap of fibers encased in plaster. It's very heavy and an absolute pain to remove. So the boys have already taken out the stumps. There's one just there, one right here. They're in the process now of taking out that one there in front of that earth spike and this one they're taking out behind that tap. Now once they re-stump this they'll jack the house up back to its original level. Beautiful. So at the end of play today you can see that the boys have removed all the offending piers and have done that right throughout the house. They've then re-dug the holes and then filled those holes with concrete and that should dry overnight. They'll come back tomorrow and then jack up off these piers where necessary to get the floor nice and level. And once that's done, I'll get these besser blocks, fly them on top of those pads and up and underneath the bearer. And they'll act as the new piers. Can't wait, a level house. That'll be novel. And this is the level that we use to determine our floor heights. And you can see how the laser shoots out a red beam. And that red beam goes right around the perimeter of the building. And the objective is to find your datum point, which is that top black mark on the architrave. Now grab the tape measure, place it on the ground and find out what that measurement is where the red line strikes the tape. And in this instance, it's a meter and 50, or about 41 and a quarter inches. Now, 
What we're trying to achieve is to get that red mark on the tape to read the same as what it is over there at that datum point, which was a metre and 50. In the corner of the house, right here, it's now reading a metre and 80. So we need to jack this corner up 30 millimetres. And you do that procedure throughout the entire house. So after all the lasering had been done, this is what we came up with. We have a mud map of our little old house. And each of these numbers represents a measurement for a pier or a stump. And at that point, we have our datum. Now you'll notice that in this corner, we had to jack the house up by 30 millimeters to get back to that datum point. Over here, up 25, up 15, up 10, and up 20. And we actually replaced all of those piers. We also replaced this one here because it had fallen over. But the real drama came when we had to lower the floor in this area by 30 millimeters. Now that caused a few dramas, but we got there in the end. It was just a little bit tricky. And yes, that is a picture of Fred Flintstone. So this is the floor that was lowered by 30 millimeters. It's fantastic now, but earlier, if you're lying in bed, you had to strap yourself in, because if you didn't, you'd roll out. And bang, through the magic of video, the house is now repaired and it's also sitting nice and level. And you might also notice how I've still got some jacks in place. That's because the mortar, which is holding these piers together, is still a bit wet. That'll be dry by tomorrow, and then I'll lower down those jacks. Job's done. I'm a very happy camper. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here with a quick handy tip for the owner builder. This is the point on the old house where the new frame is going to be attached. Now I've just had the corner of that house jacked up by 30 millimetres to get the floor level. And as a consequence, the new stud height from the slab to the top of the top plate is now 30 millimetres longer than what it would have been. Now reverse the order and if we had it framed here first, and re-stumped there second, the stud height difference would have been 30 millimeters, which is massive. So that just highlights the importance of doing things in the right order. Great tip, guys. I've got to be quiet because next door neighbor, they've just had a baby and I think she's just gone to sleep. Okay, I'll catch you guys later. Cheers. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here, and welcome to episode 12 of my Owner Builder series. All right, so what's next? The slab's been poured, and the house has been re-stumped. So the next job on the list is to get some wall framing done. But before you even start making any frames, grab your house plan and mark out your slab. And a quick tip, get your house plans laminated. You'll be referring to these time and time again. And if you don't get them laminated, they'll finish up looking like a dog's breakfast. Now, whenever you're adding a new section onto an old building, it's really important that the new section is square to the existing. So what you're trying to do is to run a string line down the entire length of the existing building and run that all the way down to the end of that slab. Once you get that line in place, then you can get a 90 degree angle off it. Once that happens, then you can pull all your measurements off that right angle. It might be simpler if I just show you. Now this is the critical time in our frame layout because we want to create a beautiful 90 degree right angle so that we can pull all our measurements off either of those two lines. So just imagine that this is the end of our old building and this red line is the edge of our slab and that red line is the end of our house. Now to get that right angle we need to adopt the 3-4-5 method which is simply increments of 3 up one direction, increments of 4 across the other direction and increments of 5 on this plane here. Now it's important that whatever increment you use, that it's the same around 
the whole triangle there. So if it's inches, they are all inches. If it's meters, they're all meters. And if it's kilometers, they're all kilometers. I think you get the idea. Now for the purpose of the exercise, I'm using inches. So I've gone up three inches, one, two, three. I've gone across four inches, one, two, three, four. And if that is a perfect right angle, then that plane there should be five inches, which is exactly what it is. And that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. Now don't panic and I'll walk you through it. You can see here how I've got a string line attached to the side of the joist running down the entire length of the old building. And I've attached the string to the bearer with a nail. And you can also see that I've got a packer on the side of that joist and I've nailed that in place. And the reason for the packer is that we want to keep the string away from the edge of that joist just in case there's a bow in it. And I've attached the packer to that joist with a nail because you don't want that packer to accidentally fall out and you not know about it. And up the other end of the house, we do exactly the same thing. Now the idea is to have one guy at the very end of the slab and they control the string line and they bring that string line in and out until it just kisses that packer. And when it does kiss the packer, then X marks the spot. Your new frame will line up beautifully with the existing. You've just got to remember that at the end to take off the width of the packer. Beautiful. Now here's a really good tip when marking out your slab. Set up some profiles like I have here Make sure they're nice and level and you can run your string lines off them. It makes it so much easier. And to control your string line, it's just a matter of attaching it to a nail or two and you can adjust those nails backwards and forwards as you wish. So there's our string line running down the slab and all the way back to our profile. Now the first thing you need to do is just to simply get a measurement off the old building and then mark that on the slab with a pencil just like that. The next thing you need to do is to get your set square and just run it across the slab until it hits that string line and then measure back from the edge of your square back the width of your frame and in my case the frame is 90 millimeters and then mark that on the slab too easy and now's the fun part marking out the slab with our chalk line and I'm assisted today with my young fella Jack who I had to drag from the surf to give me a hand and you can also see how Jack's appropriately dressed in his work boots and now it's time to do our three, four, five. Now hold your tape on our original line and then go back your increment of three, which in this case is three meters. Now hold your pencil on that three meter mark and just do a big arc, just like that. Perfect. Now from the original mark on that first line that we've flicked out, we have to do the four component of the three, four, five method. So go back your four meters, which is the increment of four, and put a mark there with your pencil, just like that. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Now on that four meter mark that you've just put on the slab, lay the tape on its edge and pull it out until you get to five meters which is the five component of the three four five method and do a big arc just like that now where these two lines cross that is the exact spot where our flick line wants to cross over and jack here 
is just pointing that out. So there's the original mark. Now it comes back to where the two lines intersect and that's where we want to flick our string line. So we hold the line down, move it across till it crosses that intersection and give it a flick. With that perfect right angle now formed, we can get our plan and pull all our measurements off this 90 degree right angle. Clear as mud, perfect. And away we go. Now this is our first big major measurement and that's for our kitchen dining living area. And just going back to the 345 method, I can't stress enough how important it is to get that right because if you get it wrong or it's slightly out, then all the rooms down the track are not going to be square, which can be a bit problematic when it comes to rooms like the bathroom and the kitchen. I had to get the grinder out here to cut off some plumbing pipes that were running up through our frame. If you find yourself having to do that, just make sure you contact your plumber first to make sure that that's okay. So we're back into marking out the frame. And I had to do the same thing to these three pipes, which are for our wall hung vanities in the bathroom, ensuite, and toilet. And you'll notice that once Jack's cleaned up, well done mate, that the pipes are beautifully positioned in our wall frame. Beautiful. And with all that done, I think we're just about finished. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here, and welcome to episode 14 of my Owner Builder series. In the last video, we looked at marking out the slab. In today's episode, we'll be marking the wall plates and also cutting the wall frame. And I also try my hand at some unorthodox butchery. Should be interesting. Check it out, and you'll see what I mean. Well, things are getting a bit more serious with all the timber arriving for the frame. i tell you what, unloading with a crane is a lot better than doing it by hand. And I'm being ably assisted today by my second eldest son, Jacob, who has kindly offered his services. Well done, Jacob. And what we're doing today is cutting all of our stud work, our window trimmers, our headers, and our noggins for our frame. And I've got Jacob feeding me timber, which I just line up with my jig and then cut to whatever length I've decided, whether that be a stud length or a noggin or maybe even a window trimmer. Now the jig that I'm using, it's a very simple jig. It's just a couple of sticks of timber screwed to a block, which I then screw to my workbench. You just line your timber up with that jig and away you go. And that's just too easy. Beautiful. Look at that sawdust. Love it. And I recommend you doing this sort of work in the school holidays. You've got to make the most of those kids. Hang on a sec. What's going on here? My old neighbour Max came over with a frozen chicken. He said, Shane, can you cut this in half for me? I said, oh well, I've got a brand new blade. Why not? There you go, Maxie boy. One chicken cut in half. Can you save me a drumstick? Good man. And at the end of play, this is a small sample of what we've finished up with. We have our two inch window and door studs. Over here we have our 90 by 35, or four by one and a half common wall studs and this is just a stack of everyday noggins. Nice throw and the rest of the stuff is out of shot. It's been a pretty big day today and Jacob's getting a little bit tired judging by his timber stacking technique which currently resembles a game of Jenga.
okay with all the framing timber now cut and the termite protection in place it's time to mark out our wall plates now here i've got my bottom and top wall plate together and they're flush on one end now this is a good tip i like to nail my plates together it makes them easier to mark to transport and you don't misplace them now i don't drive the nail all the way home i keep it slightly proud so i can insert a hammer at a later date and easily pull those plates apart and do the same for both ends once that's done and the plates are marked just simply place them back on to the saw bench and cut to length beautiful and as you can see from this shot I've almost finished cutting and laying out all of my wall plates it can be a pretty tedious job especially when doing it by yourself as you're continually checking either end that everything's in the right spot now it took me uh, for my place a good half day to get it all marked out and cut And as you can see, all the wall frames, they've been cut out and laid in place. It's looking good. Alrighty, outside, all the wall frames, they've been cut and marked out. So what I thought we'd do today is just go over a few basic, simple framing techniques. Let's do it. Now this is the wall that we'll be framing. It's a plain stud wall with an external corner down one end. Now, let's keep this simple because it really is simple. Basically, a wall frame consists of four components. We have a top plate, a bottom plate or a base plate, and these vertical timbers, they're our studs, and they're positioned at 450 millimeter or 16 inch on center. And these horizontal timbers they're called noggins and if you're doing an external frame well you'll need an extra top plate and it's as simple as that too easy now some people get confused with what an actual center is like guys talk about 450 millimeter centers or 16 inch on center but what does it actually mean well it means from the middle of one stud to the middle of the next stud is 450 millimeters or 16 inch. Now to work it out, if you measure from the back of one stud to the front of the next stud, that will give you the correct centers. Clear as mud? Cool. Now if you measure from the back of one stud to the face of the next stud, your 450 millimeters or 16 inch, that will give you your required centers. Too easy. So I've had to come inside because out there it is blowing an absolute gale. So I apologize for that. But these are those plates that I showed you earlier of my laundry wall. It's a bottom plate and that's a top plate. Now I like to nail my plates together because it keeps them intact makes them easier to mark and to move around. But I don't nail the nail all the way home. I keep it slightly proud so I can get my claw hammer in there and pull it out later. Now to mark out your plates at 450 centre or 16 inch centre, it's simply a matter of hanging your tape over the end of the plate and coming along your 450 or your 16 inch and then mark it, which I've already done. So that's just simply a matter of squaring a line down with your square or your speed square. Then put a cross on that side of the mark. We've got a stud there, we've got a stud there, and then continue that process right down the plate. It's simply a matter of hanging your tape over the end 
and then going along in those increments. So I've got 450, I'll put a mark, and you can square line across, and then put a cross on that side of the mark. And work your way along the entire plate. So I've got 450, 900, 350, 800, 350, 800, 800, 800, 800, 800. And now we get to the external corner down the end. Now grab a square and square those lines across. And when we get to the end of our wall, we had this other wall biting into it like that creating an external corner. We need to create an internal corner with our stud work so that we can attach our drywall or our plasterboard. And to achieve that, just grab your stud and place it flush on the end of that wall plate. Put a mark on your plates with a cross. So one stud goes there. We then have a block which goes next to that stud and then on the outside of this block we mark our next stud position with an X and this is going to create our internal corner to finish off our plasterboard or our drywall. Too easy. So there you have the bare basics on how to mark out your wall frames. Now what I recommend you do to prevent information overload is to go out and mark them. And when you come back, there'll be another video on how to assemble those wall frames. All right, hands up. Who's guilty of having a pencil this size? Actually having a whole toolbox full of pencils this size. I am, and it's an absolute pain. So if you're guilty of suffering the same curse, please leave the comment guilty in the comments section down below. I'd love to find out who else is a sufferer. All right, I better put the nail bag on and get some of those wall frames together. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here and welcome to episode 16 of my Owner Build series. 16. Okay, nail bag on. Check. Big breakfast. Check. Got my hammer. Check. Tape measure. Check. Pencil. Got it. And that's all I need. Let's go framing. Oh, and by the way, who needs a new hammer? Hands up. One day. Now it's getting exciting and I'm making my first frame. I'm just putting out my top and bottom plates and then laying in the studs. Now I make sure that the studs all have the crowns facing the one direction, whether that be up or down. And the reason for that is that it'll make straightening the walls a lot easier during the lockup phase. Once all the studs have been nailed in place, it's time to install the noggins. Now my walls are 3 metres or 10 feet in height, so I need two rows, which I am evenly spacing and flicking a mark with my chalk line. I then run out all my noggins and then start to install them. Now when I do that, I do it in a staggered formation because it makes the nailing process so much easier. Now this wall needs to be braced, so the first thing you do is work out your diagonals, make sure they're reading the same, and then install your bracing. Now there's a couple of types of bracing, this metal or ply, and this wall here requires a diagonal metal brace. Now it's an external wall facing outwards, so we don't need to plane that brace in. 
and these here are the metal tensioners which keep your frame nice and square and you have two tensioners per length of brace and bang here's the first wall all finished ah, only about 20 to go shouldn't take long <coughs> Now this is an external wall with a couple of windows in it and I'll quickly run you through the process. I've just put the beam in over the window and these are the two jack studs which fit directly beneath that beam to support it. The window trimmers then go in followed by the window head and this dictates the height of our windows. All the windows are the same height from the top but they vary at the bottom. Now the bottom window trimmers go in, followed by the window sill. Now that wasn't too hard, was it? Now the window next to it is slightly bigger. So first of all we put our two common studs in and then nail the beam in between them. The jack studs that go beneath that beam on either side. Once they're installed, then we put in our window trimmers and these are being cut to go in and around that beam and once again they dictate the height of our window no worries now down beneath we have the bottom window trimmers they go in followed by the window sill and then we tap those last couple into place The last stud then goes in, followed by the last couple of noggins. Job's done. With most of the frames now built, I went across the road and got my neighbour Gary to give me a hand to stand them up. Being three metres high and reasonably long, it's a fair bit of weight, so Gary's been very, very handy. Okay mate, just stay there, I'll just brace this one off and we'll get this little fella, put him in place, I feel like I'm in a Benny Hill movie. Okay, nail those two together and then we'll get this big boy, slot him in there and then a bit of a sweep and now we'll connect these two just like that and then get this last one, put him in place. <sighs> this feels good, a bit of progress. Love it. So Billy, did Dad do a good job? No. No? <laughs> right, you're in trouble, mister. Kids these days. <laughs> Kids these days, talk about cheeky. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed and found that video useful. And please stick around for the rest of the series. Okay, as per usual, big thumbs up is greatly appreciated. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Alrighty, you know what time it is. Time for a cup of tea. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. So Bill, did Dad do a good job? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> Right, you're in trouble, mister. <laughs> Alrighty. So, Billy, did Dad do a good job? No. <laughs> what? Right, you are in trouble, young man. Alrighty, thanks for watching. <laughs> do we make a deal? Yeah. G'day, Knuckleheads. Uncle Knackers here with another one minute stud wall framing tip. Now just quickly, I want to share with you a handy little framing tip. This section of frame here is going to be where my sliding door is. Now with all doorways, what I do to the bottom plate prior to making the frame is I find out where my door studs are going to be and then I draw a line across the bottom side of that bottom plate. And I grab my power saw and I'll check out or I'll cut down 
halfway through this plate. I don't cut all the way through and I do it on both ends. Now the reason why I make that cut is that when it comes time to cut out your doorways with your hand saw, you won't be running the teeth of your saw along the concrete because that cut has already been made. Now that is a good tip. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here with a quick one minute stud wall framing tip. Now whenever you're trying to square up a frame that needs to be braced, just try and find two walls that are already in place, like that wall there and that wall there. And then to simply get the frame that's on the ground and pull it up hard against these two walls. And bang, this frame is now square and ready to be braced. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here. Guess what? Remember in my last video, I was going on about how pathetic my hammer is and how I really need a new one? Well, last night, I was up on my roof, as per usual, retrieving one of my son's Nerf gun bullets. And while I was up there, look what I found. An east wing framing hammer. A bit worse for wear, a bit of a polish up and that'll come up a treat. What an absolute score. And while on the topic of the last video, a few of you asked about my saw playing abilities. And how do you do it? Well, look closely at these few tips and you'll be playing like an old timer before you know it. Now when playing the saw, the sound that you produce will vary depending on the width of the blade, the length of the blade, and the type of steel used for the blade. Now this old fast cut saw, it's way past its used by date, but it can still hold a tune. Now all you need to do is just grab the saw blade on the end, just like that. Pretty easy, it's nice and loose. And now on the other end, get your hand and put it through the handle. Bang, bang. Now on the other side, your thumb is what hits the blade and produces the vibration which creates the noise. So together, by bending this end and hitting that end, we produce this. Oh yeah! It's not too bad. Great tip, knackers! And don't forget, Big thumbs up and hit that subscribe button for more handy tips. Cheers. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here and welcome to episode 18 of my Owner Builder series. Now I just thought I'd do a very quick video update on what's been happening. Now as you can see, the frames have been built and now we're at that important step of getting those frames nice and straight. Now this job's made a lot easier with two people as you need one person up top with the assistance of a string line sighting those walls through to get them nice and straight. And the guy down the bottom is maneuvering those walls with a brace and then nailing them off. Now it's at this point that it's very important to take some time aside to discuss last night's TV. Now straightening the walls can be a pretty time consuming job, but it needs to be done prior to the roof going on. And while we're at the back straightening our walls, I have my old mate Frank O'Dwyer back with his excavator and bobcat, just removing some concrete slabs in preparation for the front veranda. And speaking of verandas, here we are having a crack and putting up the back veranda or the back deck. Now I'm just nailing off one of the side beams and here Mel is getting the beam nice and level. And we do that with the assistance of an acro prop which I wind up or down depending on where we want it to go. Here we go, just like that. 
Beautiful. Once you get that beam nice and level, make sure it's running square off the house and brace it off. With both ends secure, it's now time to put up the intersecting beams. And once again, we're using acro props to wind those beams up or down to get them nice and level. And to keep the beam straight, we're just adding some braces back to the main frame. And now time for the crown and glory putting this last big fella in place. Now you'll notice that I've just used halving joints for all of my beams. The beams aren't going to be exposed and the halving joint is actually quite good if it's directly under a post. I must say, it turned out pretty good. So there's a very brief overview of what's been happening on the work site. Actually, that all occurred about two weeks ago. A lot has happened since then, so make sure you stay tuned for further updates. And I have to give a quick thank you and a shout out to a mate of mine, Mel Sinclair, who gave me a hand with the wall straightening and also with the veranda beam erecting process. Thanks, mate. Okay, it's getting pretty late and I need to go and punch out some Zeds. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. Oh, just one more quick thing before I go. My knee has been giving me absolute curry ever since I've been going up and down ladders all day, especially during that wall straightening process. Let's give you a quick look. I don't know whether you'll notice it on camera, but it's blown up to the absolute Scheisenhausen. So if anybody out there has any good remedies or any good anti-inflammatories for a swollen knee, please let me know in the comment section down below. Cheers. G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Nakas here with a quick one minute stud wall framing tip. Now with the frame at this stage here, it's a great idea to work out where things like the clothes dryer, your toilet roll holders and your towel rails are going to be going because now we have the opportunity to block out our wall frame for where those fixtures are going to be secured to the wall. And the great thing about these blocks is that they provide a very secure footing for your fixture and the installation process is a piece of cake. Great tip, knackers! G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here with a quick one minute stud wall framing tip. Whenever you're putting in your wall noggins, make sure you install them in a staggered formation. That way it makes it so much easier to nail them off. Great tip, knackers! G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Nackers here. Hey, I just thought I'd give you guys a quick aerial overview of the frame before the roof goes on. Just so you get a better perspective of what's been happening here. So this is the back of the house, and what I'm standing on is the old existing building, which we'll be building a roof over the top of. Let's go all the way around there. So the back of the house is here, and to our left we have our ensuite, the next room is the bathroom, the next big room that goes from one side of the house to the other, that's our kitchen, living, dining, and then one right down the back with the beams around it, that's our undercover back deck. Now we come down right in front of us, that's a hallway, the next room to the right is our laundry, the next room is one of the kids bedrooms. Then we swing around past the storeroom and into our garage. Past the garage and this is our undercover carport which is all under the one roof. Then we swing around and this is our undercover front deck. Now this old existing house, this is all going to be bedrooms. So there you have it the frame before the roof goes on. I hope you get a better idea of what we're dealing with now. And you can see it's a reasonable size Renault. And the trusses are coming tomorrow, so hopefully we'll get those 
commenced on Monday. Alrighty, I hope you enjoyed my little aerial video footage. And until next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Nackers here, and welcome to episode 20 of my Owner Builder series. Now, as you probably already know, the frame has been built, and now as a matter of a timing issue, we need to get that brick wall up, which borders our neighbor's boundary. And the reason for that is that we have a pretty tricky scenario with our fascia and gutter. Normally, the fascia and gutter would sit flush with the outside skin of that brickwork. But in this case, fascia and gutter is sitting virtually on top of that brickwork. And as a result, we need to get some flashing made that goes over the face of the bricks, across the top of the bricks, then up and on top of the roof trusses before the roof iron gets installed. That's why that brick wall has to get built so we can measure up our flashing. And before that brick wall gets built, we need to install some of this vapor membrane or sizolation paper. So stick around. I'll show you how to do that and don't forget to please give the video the big thumbs up and don't forget to hit that subscribe button cheers now my garage wall is virtually on the boundary with my neighbor so as a result this wall only is going to be a brick veneer construction which will also act as a fire rated wall now before we put those bricks in place we need to install a vapor membrane to the outside of that stud work now I've always used a product from Bradford called Thermoseal. It's a vapor membrane and also a reflective wrap. And you'll notice how one side it's shiny and silver and the other side there's a color. When you put this stuff up, make sure you install it with the shiny side facing inwards. So here I am with the first roll of sizolation paper. And like I said before, I'm doing it to a chalk line to get it nice and straight. Now I should also mention that to install that paper, you use these tack on clips. You hit one into the stud and then it just bends off. It's too easy. And also when doing your paper, put the first sheet on to a string line. That way it's nice and straight and you can pull it nice and tight. Now just in case you are wondering why you need to install a vapour barrier membrane like Thermoseal or any other wall wrap for that matter is that these products are designed to provide a protective second skin from wind driven rain and dirt which in turn protects the building frame, the insulation and internal linings and also some other wraps tackle things like condensation. So it's a good idea to get some advice before you go out to purchase and install your paper as different climates can require a different type of product. So there we have the wall all papered up and ready for the brick layers. Too easy. Now just a couple of extra things to think about. When installing your paper Make sure you start from the bottom and work your way up to the top with each lap of your paper being at least 150 millimeters or six inches. And just check that the paper you're using is suitable to the type of cladding that you're installing. Alrighty, where are those brickies? Come on lads. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here and welcome to episode 22 of my own Builder series. Now this episode is going to be broken into two parts. In this two part episode, I'm going to show you how to cut and install these big posts to those veranda beams and also show you how to set up your veranda posts so they finish up in a nice straight line. So let's stop mucking around and get stuck into part one. And don't forget to give the video a big thumbs up and if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Cheers. Now before I cut those posts, I want to dig the post holes. And to do that, I just simply drop a plumb bob, which is my chalk line, down from the veranda beam where the posts have been marked. And then just simply dig a hole underneath that plumb bob. 
too easy. Now I'm just gonna show you a quick and easy way of how to attach your veranda post to your veranda beam. Now the cut that I'm going to show you is for a corner post, which is a bit trickier than a normal straight run post, but simple nonetheless. Now we need to cut two checkouts into the top of the post to accommodate two beams. The beam that runs across the front of the post, like that, and the beam that runs down the side of the post, like that. Now the first thing you need to do is cut your post to length. And once you've done that, then work out where on this post you need to check out to accommodate your beam. In my case, I've got one going across here, like that. You see that shaded area? And one going that direction, like that, which is that shaded area. So you mark that out on your two faces on your post, and then you're ready to cut. Now you wanna make the check out in your post the width of the beam that's going to be fitted to that post. Now my beam is 45 millimeters, so that checkout will be 45 millimeters. That way the beam will finish flush with the face of the post. Now an easy way to get the correct depth for that cut is to first of all unplug your circular saw and then grab your saw and place it on the face of the post. And then using the adjusting mechanism on the back of your saw, adjust the depth of that blade until it just kisses that line. When that happens, lock it off and you're ready to start cutting. Now if you plug the saw back in, that saw is handy. Beautiful. Now when I get close to the end, I turn the saw around so the wider part of that saw base is on top of that block. It just makes the cut or the saw much more stable. Now turn the post over and we now want to cut that section there out. So across here like that. And that is the tenon that we'll be left with. You'll see now that the shaded part has been cut off. Now once you've made all your cuts, which I have here, now I like to mark a line along the edge of those cuts and then cut along it with the circular saw. That way we finish up with a beautiful clean cut. Get your saw, put it to full depth, and away you go. And now, just tap out the pieces. So once you get the bulk of that meat out, grab your chisel and do a bit of a tidy up. And there you have it, the post is now ready to be installed. Too easy.
And before we finish up, I'm just going to be doing a few straight beam cuts for those intermediate posts. those posts now prepped it's time to head outside and hang them from our veranda beam which we'll go through in part two so I hope you can stick around for that one alrighty as per usual big thumbs up is always greatly appreciated and if you haven't already please hit that subscribe button till part two I'm out of here cheers G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Nackers here, and welcome to part two of episode 22 of my Owner Builder series. Now, if you saw part one, you'll remember that it finished off with us having those posts all prepped and ready to be hung on those veranda beams outside. We'll stick around for part two, and I'll show you how that's all done. Oh yeah, I've also been copying a bit of flack, or a bit of a discussion about the gray in my beard, and the length of it, and hair like a hippie. What do you reckon? Personally, I'm just going to let it all go, wild as, until the end of the job. What do you reckon? Leave a comment below. See you soon. Now this is the style of post support that I'm using to secure the post to the concrete footing. This particular model is called a center pin post stirrup. That's the centre pin, and that gets inserted into a hole that I'll drill into the bottom of this post. Now, the reason why I'm using this sort of post stirrup is because it's totally concealed. You don't see any ugly metal flanges going up the sides of your post. Let's give it a crack. The first thing you need to do is to find the centre of your post. And you do that by just running a diagonal line from corner to corner. Now I apologise for my croaky voice but I've uh, got a touch of the flu at the moment and I'm losing my voice. So there we have the centre which is right there. Now we need to drill a 25mm or 1 inch hole at that point. So I'm just going to use this 1 inch or 25mm speed bore drill bit. There we go. Now we'll drill a hole into the centre of this post, keeping the drill nice and straight. Alrighty, let's give that a go. That's perfect. Beautiful. Now all we need to do is to get a couple of coach screws and secure the stirrup to that post. Now before we do all that, we also want to run some paint inside that hole just to help seal it up. Let's do it. So just get some undercoat, some sealer primer and get it up in that hole just to help protect that freshly cut wood. There you go. I might as well give the whole base a bit of a go. The more protection you can give the timber, the better. So don't be shy, get the paint in there. Let's see right in there, that's it. And while we're at it, we'll do the other end where we've cut out for our beams. With all the timber now sealed, we can put in our center pin post stirrup. Now get it centered like that, and then do a pilot hole with your drill. So 
So there you have it. That was pretty simple. Six to go. And now all you need to do is to slide the post up and under those two beams. And then insert two bolts through each beam which will hold it securely in place. Too easy. Now the first job on the list is to attach those posts to the veranda beams and I'm doing that using my nail gun. You can bolt the posts to the beams at a later date when the job's all finished. Now a good tip when using your nail gun don't place any nails where you're going to be inserting your bolts as that can make drilling the holes for the bolts a bit of a pain. And a big thank you to a good mate of mine, Jordan, from Rewind Designs, who gave me a hand to place those posts. Thanks, mate. You're a big help. Now you're ready for it. This is how you get your posts to line up beautifully each and every time. Now the trick is to get the posts at either end of your beam set up nice and plumb. Now by nice and plumb I mean absolutely dead plumb and to do that you just attach a brace to the bottom of the post back to a picket that you've banged into the ground. Once the post is plumb you nail it off. With that job done the rest is child's play. You just attach a length of timber between the posts like this and on that timber I have the post spacing marked on it. So all you need to do is line up the post spacing to the post, what Jordan's doing here, and then nail that off. Too easy. With the post spacing all sorted, all we need to do next is to get the bottom of those posts all lined up. And to do that, just run a string line from one end of the job to the other, and then adjust your posts in and out until the post just kisses that string line. And when it does, bang, job's done. Now this is the part of the job that I love. The posts are all lined up, they're all braced off. Now all we need to do is to add the concrete. Beautiful. I told you it was easy. And check this out. The post finished up absolutely spot on. I couldn't be happier. Alrighty, with these in place, it's now time to tackle that roof and get out of this rain. So the next time, I'm out of here. I think I need a cup of tea. Cheers. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here and welcome to episode 23 of my Owner Builder series. Now, it's a big day today. As you can see, the trusses have finally arrived. And I've got the guys in from North Coast Cranes trying to place them on top of my wall frames. Now, it's proving a bit difficult. We uh, have some fairly tight space constraints, but they're doing the best they can with what space they've got. Now, we didn't get the trusses put on the frames exactly where we wanted them, but beggars can't be choosers. And I didn't want to put much more than what we have here now up, because they're all resting on one beam, and it just got a bit, a bit too heavy, so, I think that will do us. Alrighty, thanks for that fellas, and we'll see you on the next one. Cheers. And that was pretty good timing because no sooner had the trusses been unloaded and then bricks arrived. Don't you just love these machines? They're absolutely fantastic. They do all this in absolutely no time at all. Good stuff. And check this out. I love it how they load these onto the back of the truck. Look at that. What a ripper. So the trusses have turned up and the boys managed to get these big fellas up on top of the walls, which was no mean feat. They're 11 metres from pitching point to pitching point. So to get them up here, was a really good effort. Now I have trusses laid out everywhere, all over the yard, 
under my neighbor's garage. They're everywhere. But the next big thing, or the next big mission, is to get these bad boys stood up all the way over there. Now that should be interesting. Well, I've checked out the weather forecast and tomorrow and the next few days is going to be good. So with that in mind, I want to remove the old tin off the old roof so we can kick off putting up those trusses and also get a start on those bricks. As you can see, the roofing iron is pretty easy to take off, so it's all systems go for tomorrow. And I might even have a race with the bricklayers just to see who finishes first. That should be interesting. Alrighty, as per usual, big thumbs up is greatly appreciated. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. I think it's time for a cup of tea. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Nackers here, and welcome to episode 24 of my Own Builder series. Well, I'm sitting in my ute at 6.45 a.m. and I've issued a bit of a challenge today with the brick layers. The bricks have turned up and the trusses have turned up. So I've said, lads, let's have a race. Let's see who can get their job done first. They've got to lay one wall of bricks and we've got to get all the trusses up on the main section of roof. Got my cup of tea for a bit of energy. So in 15 minutes time, it's game on. They don't stand a chance. <laughs> Do they? Do they? Whose side are you on? And we're off and racing in the Bricky V Chippy Cup. The bricklayers have started off very nicely and are already up to their second course. We've got that first tip in place and are settling in very nicely around that first turn. And coming around that first bend, the brickies are already two lengths in front. And with 15 courses already done, it's not looking good for the chippies. But here they come, up around the outside. Two lengths, now back to one length. This is an absolute nail biter. It's anybody's race at this stage. You couldn't have scripted this if you tried. And as we round the last bend, with one furlong to go, ha, oh, the brickies, they're putting up some scaffold. This is gonna put them back a bit. Maybe the chippies have a chance. Oh, they've come back, they're coming back. They're a nose in front with 300 meters to go. But the brickies, the brickies are on fire. And with 200 meters to go, I'm losing my voice. Please somebody, where are my heart tablets? We're coming down to the last 100 meters. This is going to be too close to call. It's the chippies. Oh no, it's the brickies. Oh, it's going to be a photo finish. It's a photo finish. They absolutely killed us. In fact, we got slaughtered. Man, those guys can lay bricks fast. I think I was a bit cocky issuing that challenge. Now, we're going to find me a piece of that humble pie. There it is. Mm, not very tasty. So here's the roof all done. The trusses are up, it's been braced, the battens are on, and now all that's left to do is to lay some roofing blanket and then install the roofing iron. Now this is the back of the house, and if we pan around, past this valley, and this is the front of the house. And it's here where we had to blend all the new trusses over the old roof. Now if we just scoot up this valley we'll get a better bird's eye view from up the top and hopefully the wind doesn't play too much havoc because it is a little bit windy. So here we are on top and if I shoot back there there's the back of the house coming around this is the front of the house and you can see that this is the old roof that we had to try and tie in together. You can see the old hips there and the old ridge with a few rafters. And this is the very front of the house with 
the carport out the front. If we swing around, that's our neighbour's shed with our wall virtually on the boundary. And then we go down through the valley. Now this is what caused me no end of grief. It was blending all four sides of the old roof into the new roof. Seriously, I was as busy as a one-armed taxi driver with an itchy back. It was an absolute mission. Well, I hope you enjoyed and found that video useful. And a big thank you to Terry and his boys for doing that brick wall. Great job, fellas. Now, as per usual, big thumbs up is greatly appreciated. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Man, oh, what an absolute mission. I think I deserve a cup of tea after all that. And in case you're wondering, it's a cup of land chew, one sugar, and a touch of milk. So until next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. One more thing, I've got a quick apology to make. When I was editing the footage of blending the new roof into the old, I accidentally deleted the whole file. Finished, finito, cleaned out, done. I was absolutely devastated. Do you know how long it took me to do that? What an absolute doofus. G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Nackus here. If you've been following my owner builder series, you'll probably know that we're pretty much ready to have that roofing iron installed, which means that it's a really good time to have a chat about the insulation that you fit directly underneath those roofing iron sheets. And to set us up on the right track, I've teed up a chat with insulation expert and good bloke, Luke Sorensen, who is also the area general manager for Bradford Insulation. G'day Luke. G'day Shane. How you doing? Very well, thanks. Excellent. Luke is my go-to man in regard to anything insulation. And as you can see, at this point, the roof trusses have been put up, it's been battened out, and the next step is to install the roofing iron. But before the roofing iron goes on, we need to install some of this roof blanket. And Luke is the man to tell us all about it. So this stuff here, Luke, Anticon 60. Anticon 60 roofing blanket. It's made up of a 60 mil glass wool builder's blanket, bonded to a light duty foil the glass wall providing your thermal mass and the foil reflecting any heat. It's great for stopping unwanted airborne noise, like yep. rain on the tin roof, okay. or planes, or birds. Yep. Birds are yeah, on, <laughs> on cue. On cue, <laughs> making noise. Um, also stops humid air from touching the cold metal on a cold night, yep. which stops condensation. From okay, forming. beautiful. And when you install this stuff, the silver goes down on silver top of the down, baton. And the glass wall conforms to the corrugation. Okay, okay, so the, the tin goes on top of that. Beautiful. Did we talk about fire rating? No, Bradford Anicon makes up a part of your bushfire roofing system. Yep. So for details, you can get our bushfire design roofing guide on bradfordinsulation.com.au. Beautiful. Alrighty. And like we said before, this is Anticon 60, but it does go up to Anticon 1... 145. 145. Those for commercial applications, you might need a thicker blanket. And for us, a pure residential type situation, the Anticon 60 is perfect. Hopefully if you can stick around, on Monday we'll be installing some of this stuff. So stay tuned and check it out. Thanks Luke. Thanks Shane. Good on you mate. Cheers. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Nackers here and welcome to episode 25 of my Own to Builder series. Now as you can see, we're putting down some timber battens in preparation to install the roof. Hey Steve, is that a sideways moonwalk? Very impressive mate. And the reason for the timber battens is that the metal ones tend to rust being this close to the beach. Now the first job you need to do before installing the roof is to put up your fascia and gutter which is what Greg is doing here. He's putting on his brackets, and then for some reason he's asked me to have a bit of a look to see if it's all straight. Greg, I don't know if you realize, but I wear glasses and I'm as blind as a bat, so I'm probably not the best bloke to ask. Once all the brackets have been screwed on, 
just get some fascia and you run it through those brackets to make sure that they've all lined up, which is what Greg and Tice are doing here. And the boys have picked the perfect day to start the roof. The sun's out, there's zero wind, and absolutely no rain on the horizon. So everything is looking spot on. And just remember that before you screw your roof sheets off, that you've installed some roofing blanket underneath it. This is pretty exciting with the first few sheets going up. It's looking good. And these sheet metal shears make cutting the iron a thousand times easier than using your trusty old tin snips. Now how's this for an easy way to mark your roofing sheets? Jimmy marks the long point, then the short point, and then with the aid of one of these big bevels, transfers that line onto the material. And then it's just simply a matter of cutting the sheet. Too easy. And this is a tool that the boys are using to cut that roofing iron with. They're metal cutting shears, and seriously, they cut through metal like a hot knife through butter. And once you get your hands on a tool like this, you'll never look back. Our property is next to a laneway, which was fantastic, as it made getting those big sheets down the side of the house and to the back of the house a lot easier. And you may have noticed that the wind's picked up, which is never a good thing when laying a roof. The roofing boys are currently up on the roof just finishing that job off, so that now gives me an opportunity to start pulling down this old ceiling. Whenever I pull down an old ceiling, like this old horsehair type, I like to do mine in easily manageable chunks, and I do that by cutting it with a handsaw. That way one person can handle it, and it also fits into a skip bin nice and snug, so you can get more in. Good tip. And as I finish off tearing down that old ceiling, the boys are finishing off the roof. Just a few more sheets to go, and then the capping, and we're all done. And this is the end result. Happy days. With the roof now on, I couldn't be any happier, and it went up without a hitch. And the good news is that now we're protected from the weather. Good stuff. Well, I hope you can stick around for the next episode, because there's lots to come. So till then, I'm out of here. Cheers. Oi, did someone say time for a cup of tea? Yes, thanks, I'd love one. Cheers. G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here, and welcome to episode 26 of my Owner Builder series. Now if you recall a few episodes back, we put the veranda up along with those big veranda posts. Now at the time, I was very happy with the post selection. They're a H3 laminated, I said it right, laminated, H3 laminated pine posts. They're designed for external use, 
and that was all cool. But since then, we've had a change of mind and we've decided to replace all 12 posts for two reasons. Number one is that we now no longer want a painted post. We're after more of a raw natural timber look. And secondly, and most importantly, is that I'm just a bit concerned about the longevity of those posts. They're a H3 laminated pine, external use, I know all that. But our front deck, we have a beam that's going to be checked into the face of those posts. Now that checkout is going to create a bit of a pocket for water to pool in. And I think over a period of time, that'll settle in and rot those posts out. Now, to replace those posts, once the deck's in and the eaves are up, would be an absolute mission. So I think I'm just going to have to replace all of these posts. A bit of short-term pain for a long-term gain. And a bit of a budget blowout too, at $83 a linear meter for the new posts. You do the math. Anyway, I've got to stop whinging about it and just do it. Hmm. All right, here are the new hardwood posts that I'm using to replace those pine ones. And at 120 kilograms of pop, they're a bit of a handful to move around by myself. So I'm using the wheelbarrow to give me a hand. Let's do it. Oh, I can feel my back already. Good to go. There you go, all done. That's how the Egyptians did it. They built the pyramids. And bang, check them out. These are my beautiful new hardwood posts. So solid and chunky, and they look fantastic. I'm very impressed. Now these posts are made from a timber called Tonka, T-O-N-K-A, and it's a few reasons why we decided to go with this post. The first reason is that it's a solid post. It's one piece of timber. It's not laminated like many other hardwood posts are these days. And the second reason is that Tonka doesn't leach. Many other hardwood posts or hardwood timbers will leach, leaving a dirty stain. These posts won't. And the final reason is that Tonka tends to gray off over a period of time. So that lends itself to a nice beachy feel. But there's probably only one drawback that I see with the Tonka post is that because it's a solid post, it will potentially have some cracking in it over time. But personally, that doesn't bother me because that's the kind of feel that we're going for. So there's my post dilemma all sorted. And I think in the long term, it was a pretty good decision. Even though these posts are double the cost, and the fact that I've wasted a lot of time in initially putting those pine posts up, taking them down, and then replacing them with these ones. All things considered, I still think it was the right decision to make. What do you think? Would you have changed the posts? Leave a comment in the description box below. Well, I've learned something from this video, so I hope you have too. And as per usual, big thumbs up is greatly appreciated. And if you haven't already, please, hit that subscribe button. Alrighty, I've got stuff to do. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Nakas here, and welcome to episode 27, part one of my owner builder series. And as you can see here, we are removing the old boards 
and preparing them for sale. And the good news is, is that I've got a buyer, so I'm pretty happy with that. Now, when installing weatherboards, it's a great idea prior to putting in your windows and installing your cladding that you get the outside of your stud work nice and straight just by running a straight edge across the surface. And you can see here that the straight edge is rocking. This stud's proud and needs to be planed down. So let's do that. Make sure you bang any nails in first because you don't want to destroy your planer blades. That's now good. Now you just move your straight edge along and do the rest of the wall. With those studs now playing down, you're now ready put in the windows, put the paper on, and then install the cladding. Houston, we're good to go. Now what we're doing here is cutting some aluminium strip for our flashing around our door and I'll explain a bit more about it shortly. And remember, when installing this paper on a weatherboard clad house, that the paper goes underneath the window flashing. The window flashing it's on top of the paper. Get that order right and your windows won't leak. Good stuff. Now on the topic of flashing, what I like to do with a weatherboard house that has timber door jams is that I cut a groove into the back of that door jam. About five to seven millimeters deep, depending on how thick your door jam is. You don't want to cut it too deep, otherwise you may weaken that jam itself. Once that groove's cut, right around the door jam, up the sides, across the top, and underneath the sill, I then get this aluminium strip and I'll slide it into that groove. Once that's done, I'll get some silicon and run a bead right down that edge. And once that's done, your door is now totally watertight. Works like a charm. Whew! hot out there and just very quickly before I cover this wall with paper I just thought I'd show you how I had to pack the wall out to suit the wide sliding door frame and the wide window frames and to do that I had to rip down a heap of studs at 63 millimeters and nail them into the original frame if I hadn't have done that the sliding door would have gone in and it was stuck out by about 63 millimeters which would have looked pretty odd so by packing the wall out the cladding is now going to finish virtually flush with the outside of the door frame which will look a truckload better bit of work in it but well worth it And just like before, we cut the paper away from the window and then pull the window flashing out and place it on top of the paper, just like that. And once again, Gary, my neighbour from across the road, came over and gave me a hand to put up that second layer of paper. 
it gets a bit tricky when you're doing this by yourself getting up and down scaffold so thanks again Gaz much appreciated mate and there you have it all the house wrap done and speaking of wrap on this job I used CSR Bradford's new Enviro Seal Proctor wrap and I have to say that I was very impressed it's not really a paper it's more of a cloth which is breathable and that's good it's extremely tough and it's lightweight that so makes installing the product very very simple so in the words of Molly Meldrum do yourself a favor and check this stuff out well I hope you enjoyed that video and make sure you stick around for part two where the cladding gets installed all right as per usual a big thumbs up is greatly appreciated and if you haven't already please hit that subscribe button okay I better go and get that drop saw out and get some cladding cut so till next time I'm out of here cheers G'day knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here, and welcome to episode 27, part two of my own build series. Now, as you can see, it's time to install some weatherboards, or in some countries, they refer to it as siding. And the most important part when installing weatherboards or siding is to get that first board straight and level. Get that right, and the rest of the job should run smoothly. And then just simply nail the board off. And here I'm just marking where the studs are, just in case we may need to put a face nail in down the track. Drilling a hole for the water pipe. And here I'm just running a bead of sealant along the board. Yeah, that's it. Down again. Down a bit. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay. One there, like Awful, isn't it? Oh, that's gold. <laughs> oh, that's a beauty. Anyway, I'll tell you, just come away and whisk out. Right, there. There, right, hand a sec. Up, down, or otherwise. Okay. Uh, up. Up, 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 up. Down a bit. Yep, that's it. Down a tip up, down a fraction, down a fraction, yep. And here we're just making sure that both ends are reading exactly the same. Two meters and thirty. Two meters and thirty. Yeah. Two meters one hundred and seventy-five. Hang on. Oh, twenty-one seven five. Yep. Yeah. Right. And twenty-three twenty. Twenty-three twenty. Twenty. Yep. Yeah. With most of that cladding or the siding now up. It's time to get the eaves or the feet all sorted out. And here I'm just putting on some trimmers because we want the eave sheet to 
finish up flush in front of those posts. Now it's really important to get these trimmers absolutely spot on, straight and level, because if you don't, you'll see a wobble, which will look dreadful once it's all done. No pressure. <laughs> Once all those eaves have been framed out, we can then start to install the eave sheeting. And after a few days of hard work, this is how the cladding turned out. So here's the back of the house. The side of the house. And here's the front of the house. There's our garage. And if we swing around, there's our front door and front two bedrooms. Now there's a deck that goes right along the front of that wall, which will help break that up beautifully. And you can also see that I've finished all the eaves, all the soffits or soffits, as some people call them. And they go all the way back the front of the house. Now you also notice those exposed trusses, they're going to be lined with a new product from CSR Giprock called Giprock Sensitive. It's suitable for wet areas and it's treated with an antifungal product. So it's the ideal choice for this type of application. I can't wait to see it up. And finally, down the other side of the house, you can see that I've added some corrugated iron to that step out, which breaks up that big long wall of weatherboards, which I think looks pretty effective. And at this point, we are now officially at lock-up stage. Inside the house, the plumbing and electrical rough-ins well, they've been done. So next on the agenda is to have the insulation installed, followed by the plasterboard or the drywall, which will be a major milestone. Well, I hope you enjoyed and found that video useful. And as per usual, a big thumbs up is greatly appreciated. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Alrighty, I think it's time for a cup of tea. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here, and welcome to episode 28 of my Owner Builder series. <coughs> G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Knackers here, and welcome to episode 28 of my Owner Builder series. Well, today is a very, very big day. This old house is about to be totally transformed. At 6 a.m., and this is the calm before the storm. I've got my broom in hand, doing a bit of a clean up, because very shortly a truckload full of plasterboard or drywall is about to turn up. The insulation's here, that's about to be installed and the plasters are due sometime this morning. So what I thought I'd do is do a quick walk through the old house before all that action takes place. Let's do it. And starting at the back of the house, facing the backyard, we have our kitchen, living, dining area. The kitchen all the way back there. The dining table's here, and the TV is behind that camera. And if we swing around that way, we have the sliding doors that lead to our rear deck. That's our kitchen over there. Oh. And this is the kitchen window where we can serve food out to the back deck. And if we do a complete 180 from those sliding doors that go to the rear deck, we come around to our nice wide hallway and that hallway leads all the way through to the front door. So walking through the hallway, the first door on the right hand side, this is our main bathroom. We've got a freestanding bath down the end, vanity just there and a shower tucked away in the corner. We come out here, we have a toilet just there and if we swing around 
That's our backyard. We come to our internal laundry, which will be all soundproofed, which will be good. And then swing around here to one of the kids' bedrooms. Now, turn around, come this way. That's our linen cupboard. Should be able to store a few towels in there, I'd say. And up this hallway, my nice old floor, which will polish up beautifully. We have, whoop, tripped. We have, this is our media room slash kids bedroom. Come through this doorway here. And this is the master bedroom. Walk through, this is our ensuite. Got a shower over there. Got a bulkhead above it. We've got a vanity right there. And a toilet tucked away in the corner. Swing around here. Come back out. That's our robe. In our bedroom. Walk through here. We've got another kid's bedroom. Just there. And walk through to the front door. And this is the office slash spare bedroom. Now we come back down. Got a nice wide hallway. Ceilings are three meters. So it feels nice and airy. We come down this hallway and into the garage. My old workbench. That has been the best investment ever. And if we swing around, oh, well, this is a single garage, by the way. Single garage. Didn't have room for a double, which is a bit of a shame. We come around here. This is a storeroom to put the mowers and all that sort of thing. And as we walk out of our garage, we come into our carport. And as you can see, I'm in the process of putting up some eaves. They're going really well. Check out the cutouts. Got to be happy with that. We come around here. Got the front of the house. Over our garage. And that's about it. So I better get sweeping. And uh, get this place cleaned up. Because those boys will be here. Any tick of the clock. And just to jolt the old memory, this is how the place used to look like only a few months back. Sometimes I kind of forget just how far we've actually come on this project. So it's nice from time to time to have a little reminder just to keep the spirits up. All right, enough of all that. I hope you enjoyed that video. And as per usual, a big thumbs up is greatly appreciated. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. All righty, I don't know about you, but I think it's just about time for a cup of tea. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Nackers here and welcome to episode 29 of my owner building series. And as you can see, the installation of the insulation is in full swing. I've got some contractors in to install it as it's a reasonably large area and I am totally under the pump. And these guys are also so much more efficient with the use of their offcuts. Nothing goes to waste, so it's a really cost effective way of installing your bats. And while they're off doing their thing, I can be off doing my thing, which I think is a better use of my time especially when there's so much happening at the moment. And bang, here we are 12 hours later. It's now 6 p.m. and the insulation externally, anyway, 
has all been installed. Just pan around and I'm pretty happy with how all that went. Looks fantastic. And we even put a bit of sound screen on a couple of walls. Sound screen's a product that Bradford makes and it's a soundproofing bat. So for the outside walls, we're using Bradford Gold 2.0 bats. Now, like I said, we're using those externally, but also internally. Most builders only insulate the external walls. We're doing the entire house because in various rooms, we have air conditioning. And we want to keep that climate just right. So Bradford Gold 2.0 does the job beautifully. And to work alongside with the wall bats up in the ceiling, we're using Bradford Gold R3.5 ceiling bats. These bad boys will do the job perfectly. Now this room here is our internal laundry and we didn't want to hear the noise of the washing machine or the dryer banging around. So Bradford has a product out called Sound Screen, which is an acoustic bat. And it's these gray bats that are installed here. And that's why the room looks so dark. And it's amazing how different the noise sounds when you're in this room, even with the door off. I think this is gonna be perfect. Good choice. Oh yeah, don't forget, if you're installing a dryer in your laundry, don't forget to install some wall blocks to hang your dryer off. Good tip. And I've also put in sound screen bats in this bedroom that adjoins the laundry and also the living room. Now using these bats in conjunction with CSR's sound check plasterboard or drywall, this room should become insulated from the noise of the laundry and also from the TV in the living room. And hopefully, fingers crossed, the kids will stay asleep. Alrighty, after a 12 hour stint, I think it's time to go home. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. G'day Knuckleheads, Uncle Nackers here, and welcome to episode 30 of my Owner Builder series. It's amazing how every day on this job appears to be a big day, and today is no exception, because we're about to kick off with the plasterboarding or the drywalling, and very shortly, there'll be four guys turning up along with a truckload of plasterboard or drywall. And I've been told that this whole process will take about 10 days, so in that time frame, I envisage fair bit of footage so I think we might break this up into a few parts this being part one where we look at doing the ceiling battens and the ceiling sheets so till those guys arrive I think I might do a bit of a cleanup and get the show ready to rock and roll let's do it now that's a sight for sore eyes the CSR Jip Rock trucks turned up packed full of goodies all the boys have to do now is get all this stuff inside and we're ready to start hanging some sheets. I'll make a big mic back this way a little bit. Okay, let's let him go. Beautiful. Just bring him in a little bit. Careful, watch that doorway. Good work. So the plastering team of Paul, Jeff, Nate, Nate and Dane from Hickson Plastering have turned up and they've kicked off by installing the ceiling battens. Now half of the team is in the new section of the house doing that, while Nate and Dane are in the older section of the house trying to fix up the ceiling which isn't very straight or very level and they've had to do that by dropping the ceiling by 50 millimeters. So to drop those ceilings and to get them nice straight and level the boys were using a product called a furring channel. It's a metal ceiling batten but it's slightly different to your conventional metal ceiling batten like this one here which you nail directly to the underside of your truss or your ceiling joist him down. The furring channel is attached to one of these brackets 
via those two grooves and it attaches just like that. Pretty simple. Now this bracket gets attached to your truss or your ceiling joist and you can adjust it up and down until you get the underside of that fairing channel to the correct height and also nice and level. And on my job, this has been an absolute saviour because the ceilings in the old section of the house were all over the shop. Love it. Now before you install those ceiling sheets, you need to apply some Jiprock glue to those ceiling battens. And for a 1200 wide sheet, glue it 200, 400, 800 and a metre. And for full installation instructions, make sure you check out the downloadable booklet at csrjiprock.com.au. Now this is exciting, the first sheet is going up. Away they go. And how good are those screw guns? Certainly a bit quicker than the old days. And on my front and back verandas, I went with Jibrox sensitive plasterboard. I wasn't that keen on the old system of cement sheet joined together with plastic joiners because it just doesn't look very good. This product is set like a conventional ceiling and it also has antifungal properties and is highly resistant to moisture and is used in areas like bathrooms. So it makes it the ideal choice for the ceiling linings on my verandas. And with this being the last ceiling to be installed, we're almost ready to start hanging some wall sheets. The house is really starting to take shape. It's looking good. So there you have it, part one done and dusted. Part two, we'll be looking at hanging some of those wall sheets. All right. As per usual, a big thumbs up is greatly appreciated. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Alrighty, I'm gonna have a quick cup of tea and get stuck back into it. So till next time, I'm out of here. Cheers. And that folks takes us to the end of part one. Thanks for taking the time to watch and make sure you stick around for the exciting part two of the series that you don't want to miss where the renovation is done, completed, finito, whoop, finished. And that should be live up on the tube on October the 5th, 2024. Now, if you want to be alerted as to when part two is up and live on the tube, just hit the link down below and I'll shoot you a quick message. Alrighty. After all that, whew, what a mission. I think I need a cup of tea. So till next time, be good, be safe, and I'm out of here. Cheers.